Good afternoon. And soon we'll be saying good evening to Europe on the first exchange of live programs between the television networks of the United States and their affiliated stations and the European Broadcasting Union, which extends all the way from Sweden in the north to Italy in the south, from the Irish Sea to the Dalmatian coast. To the European broadcasters, this exchange of programs between nations is already a tradition, and they do it very well. Today we begin in many languages. In a moment, you'll meet some of your old friends in broadcasting who have changed roles to do the foreign language narration. And speaking for Chuck Huntley, Howard Smith, and myself, Walter Cronkite, who are speaking in English, our hats are off to them. So we commence in an attempt to catch up with the giant technological step which the scientists of Bell Laboratory and the National Aeronautics and Space Administration have made possible. This is Master Control, New York. Our live transmission to Europe and Eurovision Master Control Brussels will commence in approximately five minutes, or as soon as Europe confirms its acquisition of our video and audio signal. We shall be transmitting in seven languages on seven audio circuits to 16 European countries. And right now, we'd like an exchange of audio for test purposes. This is the English language circuit. Ici, Georges Vicas de la NBC, avec la transmission en français de New York, pour la France, la Belgique et le Canada. M'entendez-vous? Qui est John Secondari de la ABC et qui est le programme en italien? Hier spricht Michael Ingram. Ich werde diese Sendung für Deutschland berichten. Und wie empfangen Sie mich? Con ustedes, Ben Grauer de la NBC. Esta es la transmisión español para Madrid y un poco retardada para México. Dette Robert Pierpoint of CBS, some Tolatil Sveria, Noria, Danmark of Finland. Ik ben Maya van Steensel van de Canadese Radio Omroep en ik zal de vertaling verzorgen voor Nederland en België. En Brussels, are we checked through to you by audio lines? Hallo, Amerika, hallo, New York, hallo, Walter Cronkite. This is Richard Dimbleby in Brussels, Belgium. We're getting you loud and clear. One second, please. All your sound lines are through clear to Europe. Thank you, Richard Dimbleby. We'll be coming back to you. These audio circuits are also going to Yugoslavia, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Monaco, and Austria. And all audio circuits are now open. We should be telling you that uh, these translations are going to Europe by the normal cable facilities. The picture you'll be seeing in the United States actually has been relayed to the Telstar and relayed back for transmission across the United States on the normal network lines. Now we must confirm that the Bell Laboratory at Andover, Maine has acquisition of the Telstar and that the receiving station at Plumeur Boudot in France is getting it. Now that's the test director, Erwin Welber at Andover, Maine, who is doing what is the equivalent of a countdown. And how are we doing, Mr. Welber? Well, Mr. Cronkite, uh, the satellite arrived at our horizon at about 46 minutes before the hour. Since that time, for the past eight minutes or so, we have uh, turned the satellite on. It is functioning properly. We are getting the proper return signal from it. We expect the French to see it shortly. And you will be ready to give us a go-ahead signal as soon as the French do confirm that they're getting the picture. I certainly will, Mr. Cronkite. Do you have any estimate how many seconds that may be or minutes? That should be very shortly now. The, I uh, understand that the French uh, tracking system has started to track the satellite, and it should be very shortly now that they should acquire it and be capable of receiving the signals we're transmitting. How high is the satellite uh, as it relays these pictures shortly? It's approximately 3,000 miles above the Earth's surface, Mr. Cronkite. Uh, here at Andover, our uh, large horn antenna, which is under the radome, uh, is now tracking it very well. We acquired the satellite with our quad helix antenna, and it is also gathering telemetry for us. We should be receiving word from the French very shortly that they have acquired our signal and are capable of receiving your transmission. Mr. Wilbur, who are the two gentlemen on either side of you there? Well, on my left here is uh, Dick Hatch, who is now in direct contact okay. with the French. And on my right is Lyle Hegstedt, who is uh, assisting us in keeping the tests under control. What are you seeing there, Mr. Wilbur? Pardon me, Mr. Cronkite? I didn't want to interfere with the communication you were getting there. Uh, uh, what are you seeing there that we aren't yet seeing? Well, uh, on my left, I have the status of the ground station and the satellite. 
Uh, in front of me, I have uh, key sets which allow me to communicate with uh, the French or the British or Homedale or Cape Canaveral, as the case may require. I understand now that the uh, French horn, uh, the French antenna, is starting to track the satellite, and it should not be very long before they are in uh, complete auto track and capable of receiving our signal. Are you seeing anything right now on those monitors we noticed a moment ago up above your head? Yes, we have two monitors, uh, three monitors actually. The one on the left shows the signal we are transmitting uh, to the satellite. The one in the middle is showing the signal we are receiving from the satellite. And the one on the right is showing the uh, signal that could be received from Homedale if uh, we are in uh, contact with Homedale, our Homedale laboratories in New Jersey. Well, now, uh, all we can see, as this is relayed back to us, uh, on those monitors, the two on the left, are square uh, windows of light. Is there something in there we can't see? Uh, I have just received word, Mr. Cronkite, that uh, the French are ready, and uh, the program can now start. Eurovision. Eurovision, we're now putting up our Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor on the left side of our monitor. If you'll please put up your Eiffel Tower in Paris next to it. Now, when you have both the Statue of Liberty and the Eiffel Tower on your line monitor, that, of course, will mean that the circuit is closed, that this electronic bridge across the Atlantic is open. We're going to wait uh, for your signal. That's been completed. We'll go on that signal. Hello, Walter Cronkite. Hello, United States. On my television screen here in Brussels, I have on the left-hand side the Statue of Liberty, on the right-hand side the Eiffel Tower. They are both together, it's clear. So go, America, go, go, America, go. Good evening, Europe. This is the North American Continent Live via AT&T Telstar, July 23rd, 1962, 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time in the East. The New York skyline on the Atlantic Ocean. And that's the Brooklyn Bridge. On the west, 3,000 miles away, San Francisco. 12 noon at the Golden Gate Bridge, high above the entrance of San Francisco Harbor. The same sun, which has just set over the Mediterranean and the English Channel, has reached its zenith here, but is above the clouds hanging over San Francisco. On the north, one of the longest unguarded borders on this planet. This is Niagara Falls, part of the Canadian-U.S. frontier that extends from New Brunswick to British Columbia on the Pacific. On the south, the Rio Grande River, for 1,000 miles, the only border between Mexico and the United States. Here, the cities of Juarez, Mexico, and El Paso, Texas, touch. Between these two borders, between these two oceans, 180 million Americans have begun another week. We'll visit with some of them in a moment. The plain facts of electronic life are that Washington and the Kremlin are now no farther apart than the speed of light, at least technically. That what goes on in the United Nations building in New York can be seen in Belgrade and in Paris and in Bonn. Until today, the three television networks of the United States, ABC, CBS, NBC, have spoken in only one language. Today, we begin to speak in many tongues, and a group of our fellow correspondents are now narrating to you in six languages. We in television are convinced that the ability to portray immediacy, to realize what's new, what's going on, is the true significance of this new communications bridge. These first 18 minutes will attempt to show you a few of the things that are going on right now on the North American continent. I'm Walter Cronkite. Here is Chet Huntley. Good evening, Europe. We had intended to take you at this time to Washington, where the President's weekly news conference is about to begin. But because of early acquisition at Andover, we got the Telstar circuit early, and the President has not yet started. So suppose we take you to a baseball game in Chicago instead, and perhaps it's only fitting that the sporting event, one of civilization's earliest ceremonials, be the first special event to be televised across the sea. Ladies and gentlemen, we have just been informed that this baseball game is being seen in Europe right now over the Telstar satellite. Let's give all the baseball fans 
in Europe. A big hello from Chicago. No score in the ball game. At this point, the Phillies, no runs, one hit, no errors. The Cubs, no runs, two hits, no errors. Well, we realize that all of this doesn't make much sense to you folks in Europe, but if we hadn't shown you a bit of our national game on this first transatlantic show, we'd never have heard the end of it. As a matter of fact, right now, our colleagues who are doing the translating are going crazy trying to say runs, hits, and errors in Swedish and Italian. In any case, here it is, a brief glimpse of American baseball played in the biggest arena in the world, all the way from Wrigley Field in Chicago to the Coliseum in Rome. And there's Johnny Callison with a good... ...to our own people and those who are allied with us. We will therefore have to wait. I'm sorry the Soviet Union is testing. They tested, they broke the agreement, tested in last fall. We tested in response. Now they carry out another series of tests, and uh, the world uh, plunges deeper into uh, uncertainty. President, as a result of some of the congressional action on measures you've submitted to them, including the vote on the Medicare plan in the Senate, some Republicans on the Hill have suggested that perhaps this Congress could not accomplish anything further, and it might be best to adjourn and go home. Would you go along with that view, sir? Well, that would be a uh, disastrous course of action. There are still most important measures. Uh, which uh, I recognize that a good many Republicans oppose. Uh, the trade bill, the youth employment and opportunities bill, aid for higher education, the UN bond issue. These are merely some of the bills which are still before the Congress and on which the Congress should act before it goes home. Tax reform, and now I, farm bill. Congress has no farm bill, and uh, we would be reduced to uh, relying on the 1958 Act if uh, the Congress doesn't act this year. Now, I recognize that uh, the congressman who said that the Congress should go home oppose our action in all these areas. But I believe this Congress should stay here and take action on them, and I think it will. But I think we have in that one statement a very clear indication of what the issue is going to be this fall. Those who are opposed to action on all these fronts and those who feel that there should be action. And the choice, of course, would be belong to the American people. President, Mr. President, uh, was the decision of the Ways and Means Committee to open hearings on tax cut, uh, proposed tax cut, taken at your recommendation? No, I had a consultation with uh, Chairman Mills. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, the description of the purposes of the hearing are exactly uh, the ones that, uh, as I understand it, they're looking at the economy and getting the recommendation from various groups. I discussed it with Congressman Mills. It was his decision and that of the committees, but I thought it was useful. President. Mr. President, several times recently you expressed concern about the gold drain. Why does the United States, of all the major nations in the world, permit foreign holders of its currencies to exchange it for gold? And while this practice continues, even if we achieved the balance of international payments, would, be able to, would we be able to stop the drain of gold? Well, if the United States refused to cash in uh, dollars for gold, uh, uh, then uh, everyone would go to the gold standard. The United States, which is the reserve currency of the whole free world, we would all be dependent upon the available supply of gold, which is quite limited. Obviously isn't enough to finance the great movements of trade today, and it would be the most uh, uh, backward step that the United States has taken since the end of the Second World War. We uh, have substantially improved our position uh, this quarter, the second quarter over the first quarter. Uh, our loss is down to uh, almost a third of what it was in the first quarter. Our loss is... Uh, based on the first and second quarter of this year is about a half of what it was uh, last year and about a third of what it was the year before. We hope that we can bring our uh, uh, balance of payments into balance by the end of next year. Uh, we are not going to devalue. There is no possible use in the uh, United States devaluing. Every other currency in a sense is tied to the dollar. If we devalued, all other currencies would devalue. And uh, so that uh, those who uh, speculate against the dollar are going to lose. The United States will not devalue its dollar. And uh, the fact of the matter is the United States can balance its balance of payments any day it wants if it wishes to withdraw its support of our defense expenditures overseas and our foreign aid. Our communication satellite, traveling at 18,000 miles per hour, traverses our horizons in only a few minutes. And we want you to see other parts of America on this Sunday or summer afternoon. With apologies, therefore, we leave the presidential news conference and go to Cape Canaveral. This is Cape Canaveral, where Telstar has now come full circle. For it was from here that she was launched 13 days ago and now is transmitting pictures sent from her port of embarkation. 
At Mercury Control, we'd like you to meet this country's scarcely ancient but orbital pioneer, Colonel John Glenn. By now, we have proven that man can perform useful tasks in space. We have also begun to use man as a scientific observer during these flights. The man flights of today, however, are transitional. They're evolutionary, looking forward to the future. And next year, we should have our full one-day-long missions up. Beyond that, we're looking forward to Project Gemini, a two-man craft which can stay in orbit for periods of up to two weeks. Beyond that, of course, our three-man project of Project Apollo for the moon landing and Apollo will take us to the moon and back. With communication satellites such as we're using today, live coverage and the information that we gain on these flights can be shared with all of you on an international basis. I would like to introduce you now to our next man in space, Commander Wally Shira. Here at Hangar S in the White Room, we're working on the spacecraft for my flight. The flight plan calls for up to six orbits, nine hours in space. The map plot in Mercury Control shows that we've shifted our primary recovery area from the Atlantic to the Pacific, near Midway Island. We have made a number of changes in equipment and quite a few changes in the control circuits. We've installed one switch, for example, to change the high thruster usage, which we've had trouble with in the past, to turn it off while in orbit. In addition, Man can control experiments in space. We've removed the optical components of the periscope and installed an ultraviolet device and camera to photograph the air glow layer above the horizon. These photographs will help the world scientists get information about solar energy in our atmosphere and learn more about our universe. One of the biggest stories at present is the American summer vacation usually two weeks long and four time zones wide. And usually it begins in the family automobile over highways such as this. This expressway, for example, near Detroit, Michigan, can lead west to Chicago and the Prairie States or north to a vacation in Canada. This is Quebec, one of the oldest cities of the New World, celebrating its 354th anniversary. Bonsoir, Europe. We êtes à Québec via le satellite Télé-Star. Westward a couple hundred miles up the St. Lawrence River to Stratford, Ontario, site of one of the finest Shakespeare festivals in the world. Shakespeare's puck, you may recall, once boasted of putting a girdle round about the earth in 40 minutes. Well, this midsummer night, Telstar cannot quite match puck speed, but it can pay its own electronic tribute to Shakespeare, who is as much a part of the American summer as fly fishing or water skiing. You are watching a rehearsal of Macbeth, starring Christopher Plummer and Kate Reed, produced by Michael Langan. By your leave, there will be no translation for these spoken words. Hi. Ah! Who lies at the second chamber? This is a... Sorry. I... Mr. Fouillard, 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 Mr. They did wake each other. I stood and heard them. But they said their prayers and addressed themselves again to sleep. The two that lodged together. Oh, God, 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 that on this newest instrument of communications, one of the oldest and perhaps the greatest had a role to play. From the Elizabethan drama of the 16th century, we move now back to the United States and 2,500 miles westward to the World's Fair of the 21st century. And this is the 21st century World's Fair in Seattle at 12, 12 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, July 23rd. As the Eiffel Tower, built for the 1889 exposition, stayed to become part of the Paris skyline, this space needle, 606 feet high, will remain the fixture of the Pacific Coast landscape. From the revolving restaurant atop the needle, a panorama of Seattle and its famous waterfront.
But inevitably, the visitor's eye is drawn back to the fairgrounds. This is the United States Science Pavilion, which together with exhibits representing some 50 nations provides a midway of art, science, and fun. Crowds of a half million a week come to take a trip on a sky ride. Watch the Spanish flamingo dancers. Or Hawaiian hula girls. To rest their feet in a Formosan pedicab. Or eat a Belgian waffle. Today is the start of Japanese week at the fair, and performing in front of the surging international fountain are the Bonadori dancers. Their ancient steps spanning the centuries to tread on the paths of America's space age spectacle. The American summer can also be a trip to one of our 1,300 national and state parks. This is Custer Park in the Black Hills of South Dakota, where the deer, the antelope, and the buffalo still roam and are herded by real live cowboys. Nearby lie buried the legends of the West, Wild Bill Hickok, Sitting Bull, General George Custer. Here each summer, more than a million Americans come to play, spend their vacations, camp, and pay tribute to the granite faces on Mount Rushmore, where four of our presidents are enshrined in massive carvings, each 60 feet in height. George Washington, our first president. Thomas Jefferson, who articulated the American idea. Abraham Lincoln, who held that idea together in time of crisis. And Theodore Roosevelt, who made us aware of our international responsibilities. Today, the park's visitors are listening to the 312-voice Mormon Tabernacle Choir, which has come here from Salt Lake City, Utah. President Lincoln said this 100 years ago about a divided country, but today it has equal meaning to a divided planet. The dogmas of the quiet past are inadequate to the stormy present. As our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. Thus far, this transatlantic live television program has originated in North America, predominantly in the United States. But there are 16 acres on the edge of the East River in New York City, which belong to 104 nations called the United Nations, where daily thousands of people from all over the world come to visit. And it is unthinkable that a portion of this first transmission should not include a visit here to the General Assembly and the other chambers where nations debate their differences and negotiate their agreements, and where Secretary General Uthant guides the work of this world body, but also to the meditation room at the foot of the tall glass shed. My name is Howard K. Smith. The man who created this room, the late Dog Hammarskjöld, called it a room of silence where only thoughts should speak. Because the United Nations is a house of many faiths and many lands, None of the usual religious symbols are present, just some simple benches which can be faced in any desired direction 
and a small mural, and an eight-ton slab of iron highlighted by a single shaft of light. We all have within us a center of stillness surrounded by silence, Mr. Hammerschild once wrote. This block of iron is meant to lead thoughts to the need for choice between destruction and construction, between war and peace. The block of iron is part of the wealth that we have inherited, and the eternal question is, how are we going to use it? As we contemplate that, it is perhaps proper that a moment of silence be transmitted from this room of quiet to our satellite and back to another side of the Earth. For ten seconds, therefore, our transmitters will, in many languages, be silent. July 23, 1962, was produced by the Combined Television Networks of the United States. The American Broadcasting Company, the Columbia Broadcasting System, the National Broadcasting Company, with the cooperation of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Well, Chet, it looks like it went very well. We had a report from uh, Brussels that the picture came in clear there. We had a little rollover when we switched from one scene to another, but uh, nothing disastrous. We've had that on this side of the Atlantic, goodness <laughs> right. knows. And over here on Unifax, while you were uh, making uh, the uh, tour of the United States, I was watching the Unifax machine. The pictures are coming in as they were transmitted back from Europe to us, taken off the tube in, uh, in uh, Brussels and London. Let's see if we can get a little of this off. Kennedy's picture is just coming in now. This is a Polaroid camera shot of an ordinary television receiver in Brussels. Uh, that's right. So I understand it. Yeah. Let me see if I can get this thing off here now. <laughs> get, you can get through to Europe easier than I can get that off the machine. Mm, uh, that picture's not complete, as you see, but yes. it's a good, clear picture of the president. Huh? Well, it's reassuring to know that we'll all look good in French. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I hope if our uh, excellent friends over here translate us properly, we'll look uh, all right, I suppose. Well, that's the end of the first phase of the exchange of programs between the television networks of the United States and Canada and the European Broadcasting Union. And approximately uh, two hours and 45 minutes from now it is, uh, the Europe to America program will be beamed to us via Telstar. Howard Smith, uh, over at the United Nations, you're going to have to get back here to the studio, aren't you? Yes, I will, Walter, and I'm looking forward to seeing what Europe will do now. And you will have a part of that program on the American side. I look forward to it. Right. Well, I've enjoyed it. Right, Howard. Goodbye. It'll be just a few minutes before 6 Eastern time, but in Europe, of course, it'll be 11 o'clock, so we shall be seeing Paris, and London, and Rome, and those other cities by night. It'll be well worth watching. Good night, Europe. Good night, Chet. <laughs> Good night, Walter. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that everything you saw over the NBC television network was relayed back to Earth from Telstar, just as it was being relayed to Europe. Our competitors apparently didn't think the signal from Telstar was good enough. I thought it was phenomenally wonderful. And in a few minutes, we'll have Western Europe's reaction. But first, here again is Whitfield Con Connor with a message from Gulf. To millions of motorists, the Gulf orange disc has a very special meaning. It's the friendly and familiar sign of good Gulf service wherever you travel. It's also your assurance of unsurpassed quality in each of the fine motoring products sold by Gulf. Gulf gasoline, motor oil, batteries, antifreeze, and Gulf tires. You will find millions of Gulf passenger car tires in service every day. It's difficult to think of another product where Gulf quality 
is more important to your safety. Golf tires are designed to give you extra reliability and safety, even in punishing service like this. Their special tread designs provide sure-footed traction in all kinds of weather. Your neighborhood golf dealer carries a complete line of fine golf tires to fit your car, your driving needs, your budget. Stop in and see him soon at the sign of the orange disc. We've just seen North America's first combined television program sent to Europe. Now let's find out from NBC correspondents Joseph C. Harsh in London, John Rich in Paris, Piers Anderton in Berlin, and Irving R. Levine in Naples, how that effort came across through Eurovision's facilities over there. Joe Harsh, will you lead off from London? Yes, Red, the picture was superb. Uh, interestingly enough, the part of it that came through best was the shots of Cronkite, uh, Huntley, uh, and then the baseball game. It wasn't quite so clear for when, the, when Kennedy came on from the State Department. We did not get your Eiffel Tower simultaneously with the Statue of Liberty here, but you saw it there, I gather. We saw it here. I saw it on my monitor before it was announced as being simultaneous. Uh -huh. John Rich in Paris. How did it look to the French? Oh, Red, I'm as speechless as a TV correspondent can let himself be. It was just magnificent here. And if I tell you that uh, out there in Chicago, that number 34 pitching... Uh, threw a low and outside one just before he threw the one they hit to right field. You'll get an idea of how good it was. It sounds wonderful. How was the French, which we fed you, the language? Uh, well, we, we noticed that the uh, French from Quebec was a bit different from what they speak here in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> well, stand by, John and Joe. Here's Anderton in Berlin. How did it look to the West Germans? Well, Red, we got a very good picture here in Berlin, and that means that it could be seen in communist territory in East Berlin. It's about uh, less than a mile away from what is the range over the curtain of those West Berlin stations, Piers? Well, the, uh, anyone in uh, East Germany up to uh, oh, 100 miles can pick up the signal. But there has been a drive to prohibit uh, looking at uh, Western television. Uh -huh. Irving R. Levine, our Rome bureau chief down in Naples. How'd you see it down there? Uh, uh, sorry, you can't get Irving. Uh, he, we've lost him somehow, rather red. Irving has lost... Us, or we have lost him? We that's, have lost Irving, apparently. That's too bad. We better call in Telstar. Gentlemen, would you like to talk to each other about this? We'd like to listen in. What do you all think of, of it over there, combined? Well, it was a terrific thing, of course. Uh, Red, I have Warren Trabant. I think he's still on the telephone, down at Lanyon, where this was being picked up, down on, in Brittany. If you have any questions you'd like me to ask him... Uh, we have him standing by. Uh, yes, John. One uh, technical question, please. We had, uh, only for a few, few brief seconds, an audio weakness in the relay back from Telstar, and then we got a rollover every time cameras switched in the United States. Did you experience the same problem? Uh, yes, we were getting the rollover there and a little, uh, a little bump in the signal, too. Uh, Warren, how do the uh, engineers, the French engineers down at Lanyon, feel about this thing? I guess you've lost him. I'm very case, excited, he says. Right. I've got him read. Uh, John, I'm sorry. We have to leave you, but we'll be talking to you all again later. All right. Then. Thank you very much, NBC correspondents in Europe. Two bits of history and more to come from Europe to America. But first, here's Whitfield Connor to reveal just one major activity of Gulf. This is a service station. Gulf put it with an eight foot hose near you for your convenience. This, too, is a service station, but its hose, starting at Gulf's Port Arthur refinery, is 150 miles long. Through this pipe and across the Texas terrain moves ethylene, the raw material for countless plastics and modern-day conveniences. Ethylene is a high-purity gas that Gulf makes from petroleum. Gulf pumps out over a million pounds of it a day. Because Gulf pioneered in assuring the supply of ethylene, chemical manufacturers one by one have built their plants along the pipeline until now it services one of the largest chemical complexes in the world. Whether Gulf is pumping ethylene to industry or high energy gasoline to your car, Gulf is delivering fine products and service to you. Putting another bit of history behind it, Telstar will now rest for two and a half hours while its solar batteries build up energy for another epoch. As it descends over Russia's horizon, 54 Eurovision crews are getting ready to send to America a program of life as it is being lived at that moment in Europe. 
From the land of the midnight sun, Laplanders herding Rainier and daylight, to the midnight sailing of Sicily's sardine fleet. From the Etruscan art of Yugoslavia to the seafaring mercy fleet of Cornwall, one exciting aspect of Western Europe after another will come alive in your living room. We'll be here with the BBC's Richard Dimbleby to help guide you through the wonders of a continent that is the basis of all our heritage, and now through Telstar is our television neighbor. NBC News will resume with Europe's transmission through Telstar at 5.30 Eastern Daylight Time this afternoon. And I'll be back to help you then. This is Merrill Muller, NBC News, New York. Good afternoon. This special NBC News report has been brought to you by the Gulf Oil Corporation, producers of more and better energy from oil. This has been a presentation of NBC News. Live Europe to U.S. by Telstar today at 5.30 Eastern Time.